If you think you already know how the story of ice and fire ends, guess again, because the winds of winter are blowing. Lift your arms, said Penny. There, that's better. Maybe you should command the Yunkish men. They use slave soldiers, why not slave commanders? That would ruin the contest, though. This is just a Sivas game to the wise masters. We're the pieces. Tyrion canted his head to one side, considering. They have that in common with my lord father, these slavers. And that was from Tyrion's Winds of Winter sample chapter. The Winds of Winter are already starting to blow just a little bit. And this passage gives us a very nice idea of Tyrion's thematic role going forward as he moves from a piece scurrying around on the battlefield, a pawn, if you will, to the role of player of the great game, Sivas player. We're going to talk more about the Sivas themes going forward, but hey, this is LML. Lucifer means Lightbringer, and I'm here with Quinn from Quinn's Ideas to talk about the most anticipated Winds of Winter plot lines. That's right. Over the next 23 days, starting right now, we'll be releasing videos alternating between both of our channels, covering all of the awesome stuff that's coming in A Song of Ice and Fire, Book number six, from Jon Snow's The Resurrection to Euron Greyjoy's Apotheosis. So make sure you subscribe to both of our channels so you don't miss anything. And those links will be in the description, of course. So why don't you set the scene? All right, so it's pretty obvious that Tyrion is probably gonna be Danny's hand. And it's pretty clear that his guile and political skills will likely come in useful for helping Danny solve the various political issues that are going on in Marine right now. And then also the dragon themes in Tyrion's arc have seem to be leading him towards helping Daenerys from what we've seen so far. And Danny does need help with dragons. That is very clear. She's only just starting to get the hang of it. And that's barely based on her connection to Drogon, not really any sort of knowledge. She's purely running on instincts. So absolutely. Clearly Tyrion is a useful kind of guy. But before we talk about how useful he is, we gotta talk about the fact that he is a much darker figure in the books than on the show, isn't that right? Yeah, so Tyrion is much different in the books than he is in the show. There's a massive difference. Uh, he raped that servant in Illyrios. Uh, he's been just generally abusive. He doesn't treat Penny really all that well. Mantras about raping and killing his sister Cersei. He obsesses over what Tywin and Jaime did to him involving Ty Tysha, and I think that's one of the most, one of his biggest traumas. Yeah, and they kind of removed that whole trauma from the show to begin with, yeah. and that is really one of the, it's one of the main things. I mean, it's horribly cruel. It's a heinously cruel thing that George thought of, you know, to be this sort of backstory for Tyrion, and there's a lot of issues with Tyrion, and certainly many of them are his fault and a result of his decisions He's very paranoid. He tends to think that everyone hates him only because he's a dwarf and not because he tends to be an a-hole mm -hmm. sometimes. However, the Taisha thing is a major formative issue for him, and it's completely removed from the show. And of course, it's you know well said in the fandom that by the time we get to the end, Tyrion's been completely whitewashed, probably the most whitewashed character yeah, in the I, show. I think he was most heartbroken because Jamie was like the only member of his family that he actually got on with. And to learn about this betrayal, it just kind of just committed him to the downfall of his entire family. Yeah, and along the lines of what we've been saying about, you know, the Winds of Winter is going to show us a lot of things that the show didn't. Mm -hmm. Like in the show, they didn't make Jamie culpable. No. Uh, and so Tyrion and Jamie ended on pretty good terms, and it set up all this very weird melodrama where Tyrion and Jamie were just sort of acting very out of character. All of that stuff that we saw is 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 invalid as far as the book yeah. canon because Tyrion hates Jamie almost as much as the rest of his family. Although, you know, there's something to be said for Jamie being manipulated by his father. He wasn't very old either. But from Tyrion's point of view Yeah, from Tyrion's point of view, like that was the only time that he had real love and it was taken away from him. Um, by someone that he trusted and Jamie has had to, has been lying to him this entire time and has been keeping this secret. Um, so yeah, it's really hard for Tyrion to deal with, and there's a there's a lot of bitterness. Yeah, that was like kind of the last connection to his family that he cared about, Jamie, and they retained it on the show. Whereas in the books, he's completely severed, and that contributes to him really hitting a deep bottom in the in a Dance with Dragons that we don't see on the show. And continuing with that, he's also so you know to sum that up, he's committed to the downfall of his house. He's promised away the Lannister gold to the Second Sons, so he's not really thinking about the future that much. 
you know, as we said, he's bitical. He's bitical, cynical, and bitter. At you least, could just run those together. Bitical. Yeah, <laughs> but at least he's not thinking about the future of his house, of House Lannister. I think Tyrion is probably thinking, "I'm never going to see that gold, so why not sell it away?" He just wants to maybe try and hurt Cersei as much as possible. Right, and that's reflective of someone who's you know mostly fixed on vengeance as opposed to future planning. Vengeance. Hopefully, that'll change, and we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But. In the books, you have to remember, him and Penny were supposed to be fed to the lions yeah. and then weren't at the last second. Was it Danny that called it off? Uh, or was it someone else? I forget who called oh, it We should have done more prep work. But that's okay. I think it was Danny who called yeah. it off. <laughs> oh, this just in? It is Daenerys. Confirmed. <laughs> Through the magic of time travel and editing, we have found out that it is indeed Daenerys who calls it off. So, in point fact. being, Tyrion knows that they were almost fed to the lions and they were supposed to be fed to the lions. So this just contributes to his cynicism. He's, you know, it's kind of like a near-death experience, essentially. But what's interesting about the whole thing is that he's still kind of removed from it. He's barely taking any of this seriously. He's, he's taking a step back and looking, like we mentioned earlier, and looking at this like a Savas game, which I think, will it helps um, as far as, like, being more analytical. Yeah, it's, there's, and there's a lot of quotes to support that. We opened... Uh, we opened with one of those, but, you know, here's another one. I was just recalling my first battle, the Green Fork. We fought between a river and a road. When I saw my father's hosts deploy, I remember thinking how beautiful it was. Like a flower opening its petals to the sun, a crimson rose with iron thorns. And my father, ah, he had never looked so resplendent. He wore a crimson armor with his huge great cloak made of cloth of gold, a pair of golden lions on his shoulders, another on his helm. His stallion was magnificent. His lordship watched the whole battle from atop that horse and never got within a hundred yards of any foe. He never moved, never smiled, never broke a sweat, whilst thousands died below him. Picture me perched on a camp stool, gazing down upon a Saibas board. We could almost be twins. If I had a horse, some crimson armor, and a great cloak sewn from cloth of gold. He was taller too. I have more hair. And so there we see in the opening quote, there was that brief mention of Tywin. And then this is essentially actually just a couple paragraphs along the one we just read, where he's filling that in. You know, he's, the image that he saw of Tywin at the Battle of the Green Fork, when basically, and if you remember, Tywin essentially sends Tyrion and the mountain clans into the most dangerous part because they're essentially his expendable troops yeah and Tyrion doesn't realize that until after the battle and it's yeah I mean what a bucket of ice water to throw on you <laughs> and, it, and it's kind of indicative of the fact that maybe once Tyrion is advising Danny he'll be willing to kind of go to those places because to him it is just kind of a game he'll be willing to make bigger sacrifices and do things that you know might be considered cruel by some people yeah definitely and it's just one thing on top of another. You can see the writer's hand as mm -hmm. far as shaping the character. So you ask yourself, what is that going towards? Well, he's, you know, some dark places. And that's how we started off this video, is just by saying he's not going to be the good angel. If anything, it's going to be more like the opposite. There so. are a lot of deliberate alterations in the show that make him seem a lot nicer than he is. But. Yeah, and I think most of that is just due to Peter Dinklage being really charming and awesome, mm -hmm. and they're just sort of going with... It, it's well established that they like to let the characters sort of lead based on the actors, yeah. as opposed to the... But we don't need to go there. So, next subject is just what we were talking about. How is Tyrion going to influence Daenerys? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there are, is potential for Tyrion to influence Danny towards more violence, because he has those vendettas against the Lannisters. But at first, we, we actually think that it's likely that Danny might inspire Tyrion a little bit, both by the fact that she presents a hope for a different future, mm -hmm. ending slavery and all the things that she stands for, and also just the fact that there's a nice challenge for Tyrion. And we mm -hmm. saw in A Clash of Kings, when he was given the challenge of being Hand, he actually did try to rule well, and he was very engaged by that challenge. And so there'll and be a similar- a lot of great things. Yeah, he did. And so there'll be a similar thing for him to rise to here, you know? And that's what he kind of needs to do, is prove himself useful to Danny. I think that Tyrion's desire for revenge will come into play uh, once they get to Westeros. I don't think he'll necessarily be the bad angel on Danny's shoulder, but he won't be the good angel, right? So, and I think there'll be probably some key moments where his like negative influence will come into play, um, and it'll maybe like send Danny to probably cause her to do something, I guess, more aggressive or more, I guess, rash than she maybe should have. Yeah, the, and the two things that we identified as likely, you know. 
uh, trigger points for that sort of event would obviously be something involving the Lannisters because he has the grudge. You know, his knowledge of Cersei will be helpful, uh, but his vendetta against Cersei yeah. could color his judgment. And then the other one would be Fagon, yeah. because it seems like the Fagon Danny thing is headed towards a tragedy. Tyrion will be advising Danny. That is potentially a King's Landing, you know, Danny stepping back from the brink of violence yeah. as opposed to, you know, going full Hitler well, or whatever. I don't think Tyrion would stop anything that could potentially hurt Cersei, right? He would he would definitely be like, just go ahead and do it. and Because he wants her dead. And the same with Jaime, I think. For the most part, it's totally different, like we mentioned before. Yeah, and with Cersei, it's unquestioned. So yeah. I think that's one of the key things to look for, keep your eyes on, is whenever she gets to King's Landing. I don't think that Tyrion will be so incompetent. Like, in the show, he's fairly incompetent as yeah. far as advice. Everything he advises Danny to do fails. I doubt that we'll see that, but, you know. Yeah, like we said, he's looking at the whole board here, right? He does have his desire for vengeance, so that's important to keep a check on, but he's looking at the entire Savas board. And you know, seeing where the pieces fit and putting things together. Right, and that is one of the one of, again, seeing what the what the author is doing to shape the character. By giving him this detachment, you know, it's good and bad. It it, it that detachment might enable him to be somewhat cruel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've seen as obviously Tyrion has that streak in him, but it also allows him to observe things in a very intelligent way that Danny's other advisors can't, like Barristan. Grey Worm, you know, Missende, who again in the books is 10, very gifted, but only 10. Mm -hmm. You know, Tyrion brings a a kind of advice and a kind of knowledge and experience that she she just doesn't have. And that Syvast metaphor seems to be the one that George chose Mm -hmm. to sort of embody that. So very cool. Very cool. I like the like the symbolism. I'm I'm just trying to say Syvast. I say chess half the time when I'm trying to say (laughs) Syvast. So we can talk about how useful Tyrion will be for Daenerys as well. So Tyrion's skills from King's Landing obviously could allow him to teach Danny to see through, you know, like all the treachery and the lies of the people in Marine because it's basically kind of a repeat almost of what was going on in King's Landing. Everyone's trying to get one over on Daenerys. And so I think she'll, someone like Tyrion who is used to these type of people and used to these types of schemes will be uh, almost... uh, What's the word? Uh, I can't think of the word. But he'll be extremely useful. Indispensable. Indispensable is the word I was looking for. That's it. And yes. and it is very similar. Um, it, Marine is is full of liars. Like yes. you remember Sandor Clegane's line to Sansa, where like King's Landing is full of liars, and you're the worst one here. Mm-hmm. That's kind of royal court in a nutshell. And in Marine, it's even worse because Danny is but a young girl, and she uses that line as uh, you know against her enemies but it really is true she's 15 she doesn't have a lot of experience she's doing her best but marine is a foreign country she Mm -hmm. doesn't know the culture and the whole of dance with dragons which i just sort of re-listened to danny's chapters from it just seems like a game of trying to figure out who is lying to her and when and Mm -hmm. the answer is probably most of them (laughs) most of the time so green grace his dar shave pate uh seneschal resnack they're all you know Tyrion will definitely, yes. And one of the things he might do to cut through some of those lies is cut some people's heads off. His dar, definitely, I could see. Shave pate, perhaps. Again, Savas, I gotta get rid of this particular piece, and, you know, it'll help fix the situation. So Tyrion seeing things in this way and operating without any ethical or moral attachment um, and creating peace through cruelty is, will potentially create a moral dilemma for Danny once she arrives in Marine. So he's created st- stability through like very brutal tactics. So it'll be curious to see how Danny would react to something like that because she's always kind of trying to balance that in her head. How far should I go? How cruel should I be? Right, like she's been wrestling with this Marinese knot this a politics for a while. She has these young hostages from the pyramids. Shave Pate wants her to execute them. She resists and she even marries his star, which is kind of a compromising of her purpose. And so it's all about... She's trying to rule. She's even though she has, you know, trouble with the Marinese, she's trying to rule justly and she avoids violence as much as possible, walks that line, you know, that she does the sharp questioning of the wine cellar and his daughters. Um, but for the most part she has resisted the mm-hmm. shave pate slash King Dario route. Tyrion's very likely to go that route if he feels like it's the best way to go, you know. For Tyrion, the end will justify the means, I think. But for Danny, the means is very important. So, yeah, that'll create conflict in her mind, I'm sure. 
And there's always the Tyrion is Tywin writ small question. Like, what lessons did he really take from Tywin? What is he going to decide to say, I don't want to be like that, or this is how you get things done. Mm -hmm. You know, you catapult the baby over the wall like Jamie was threatening to do or whatever. I think Tyrion is a lot more like Tywin than a lot of people think. Yeah, so that's going to be something to keep an eye on. Um, and the next point we've got is the, uh, the possibility that maybe Tyrion won't have completely solved the problems in Marine by the time Danny gets back. Maybe they'll solve it together, a little teamwork, a little I like this idea. friendship I, montage or yeah, something. Yeah, because you know? it would help them bond, and it would it, be cool to you know, have Tyrion kind of point out all the things Danny has been doing wrong and, you know, kind of like point out when somebody's lying to her, like kind of be like the person that just like kind of stands on the side and like tells her what's up. Yeah, we'll see. So it's some continuum of Tyrion, you know, uh, and, and Victarion, of course, because mm -hmm. Victarion's also very good at political intrigue, solving the problems in Marine before Danny gets back or helping her when she does get back. And along a similar lines, you know, uh, Tyrion's, you know, potentially going to help her with the dragons, which we'll get to in a second. But mm -hmm. before we talk about that, we just want to point out the fact that as Tyrion says, you know, he's in, I think it's a show line where he says, you know, I'm good at killing your enemies. He killed Tywin. He killed uh, Joffrey. He's the greatest Lannister so, killer who's ever lived. Exactly. So that's, you know, that's going to help. Uh, the biggest thing is that he knows Cersei. Mm -hmm. And as of right now, they think Cersei is going to be the one that they have to contest with in Westeros. He knows the Red Keep really well. He knows Casterly Rock. So we don't need to belabor that point. And Tyrion is obviously, as, as we were said, indispensable. Uh, and then the last thing I want to throw out about Tyrion being useful is the gargoyle mythology. And... Uh, I'll just shout out my Tyrion Targaryen episode on my YouTube page. But basically, Tyrion has a lot of gargoyle symbolism. You guys probably remember. He's been called a gargoyle several times. He's also called a monkey demon, which is, has its own line of mythology, but is really just another type of gargoyle. Gargoyles frequently have like a weird demonic monkey kind yeah. of look. There's all sorts of ways they can appear. But the point, without going all the way deep into it, is just that gargoyles, the gargoyle mythology... Um, comes from dragon mythology. The first gargoyle was a dragon head that was cut off and put on to a church to ward off other evil spirits. Mm. And that's the whole purpose of gargoyles is to ward off evil. And so they're kind of like on team dragon. And of course, Dragonstone has tons of gargoyles. Yeah. And their whole thing is warding and protecting by being scary. Yeah. So Tyrion walking that line of violence, you know, it's going to be an ethical issue but he's probably going to be a pretty good protector for Danny. He'll help keep the worst people away from her. He'll be her little gargoyle to ward off the evil things. There you go. So you heard it here first. And then, of course, as we said, Tyrion could help with the dragons. All right. Yeah, so Tyrion's been curious about dragons his entire life. Uh, he's learned as much as he could through the years. He took the books from the Winterfell Library before it burned down. Um, One of which was about dragons for sure, if yeah. not more. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there was that Makoro dream where he was, you know, we read it last time, but Makoro sees dragons all around him, bright and dark, and he's snarling in the middle. Mm -hmm. Unclear whether he's supposed to be considered a dragon, but even if he's not a dragon and just a gargoyle, he's mm -hmm. a dragon person, and he's been having those dragon dreams, yes. you know, since he was young. He's also dreams about burning his family and stuff, but, you know, it's, again, the darker Tyrion from the books. <laughs> um, and then, of course, there's the question of whether or not, and I, I placed my Tyrion toy next to the white dragon's egg, because there is some foreshadowing that there might be a Viserion-Tyrion connection, and we'll give you that quote right here. The white Savas dragon ended up at Tyrion's feet. He scooped it off the carpet and wiped it on his sleeve but some of the Yunkish blood had collected in the fine grooves of the carving, so the pale wood seemed veined with red. All hail our beloved Queen Daenerys, be she alive or be she dead. He tossed the bloody dragon in the air, caught it, grinned. We have always been the Queen's men, announced Brown Ben Plum. Rejoining the Yunkai was just a plot. So we've got a bloody white dragon there's also a little bit of weirwood ideas with the white wood streaked mm -hmm. with blood, but he holds it up and starts talking about Daenerys. So it's pretty easy to to see that as yeah, having something connection. to do with yeah as a white dragon thing. Tyrion also has potentially could match up with the white lion uh, from one of Danny's visions as well. So mm -hmm. that's just up to up for debate, but I definitely think that Viserion is the dragon that he might have a connection if with. If Tyrion were to have a connection with one of them, it would, it would definitely be. Be Viserion. That's one where the show really, really pulled our pulled they our chain. They almost went there just a little bit, but then they were like, "Nah." We petted we're not him on the do nose. Is he a Targaryen? Could he be the one? 
<laughs> Could he be the one? But they didn't go there, so. No. Yeah. So, conclusion, Tyrion will find his one true love, Tysha. He will marry her. They'll have children. They'll live happily ever after. In, in a, a cabin cottage, in the In a crofter's woods. cottage, yeah, in the woods. Exactly. exactly. Uh, no. Most likely... Like I'm sorry to break you guys' hearts. <laughs> that's not happening. No, that's not a George Martin story. It's going to be darker. And like we said, he'll gain favor with Danny by helping her smoke out the Sons of the Harpy, maybe helping her control the dragons, and, you know, uh, managing the new intrigues with the Victarian showing up and all the other things going on. Uh, and that he, you know, won't necessarily be the devil on Danny's shoulder, but he won't be the angel either, as you said. So Absolutely. So we're all looking forward to seeing what goes on between Tyrion and, and Danny in the Winds of Winter. And then just one extra little detail, if I recall correctly, about the time that the uh, TV show had Danny and Tyrion meeting, George made some sort of comment that Danny and Tyrion will be meeting, but it should be probably towards the end of the book. And that makes sense if you think about it. Danny's in the Dothraki Sea, shout out for, and most anticipated plotline video number three coming your way. But she's got a few things to do she's in the Dothraki Sea. Yeah, totally. So this isn't something that's going to happen right away. You know, Tyrion's going to be waiting around and solving puzzles and probably towards the end of the book we'll see it. It'll so. be cool to see it. It is a most anticipated moment for sure. These are two of the main characters and so we're looking forward to it a lot. Absolutely. Alright, thanks guys. We'll see you again with video number three.